Well, church, what is the what is the most important thing that we do as Christians? Uh, I think high on that list might be the fact that we've been called to be witnesses and that we are to be salt and light to a watching world, that God is concerned with how we represent him in, in this world. Certainly we are called to be faithful members of the body of Christ and to, and to um, love one another as Christ loved the church. As he said, they will know us by our love for one another. Certainly our families that we raise, if God calls us to raise a family, is high on the list of important things that we will do. Passing down the faith has to be high on the list of what we desire to do. We spend our lives in a vocation, 40 plus years at a job. That's important. But there is one thing that we know. Now, some say there's surfing and whatnot in heaven. But there is one thing that we know we will do in glory, and that is worship the triune God. Forever, we will spend our days worshiping the Lamb that was slain. And as we've seen last week, Jesus, our Lord, the Word of God, or, or God, is concerned about how He is worshipped. And we spent last week talking about that, and I'm going to continue in that vein today. So if you have a Bible, please turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is, we were, is where we will be today. I'm going to read a larger section of Scripture, but we're going to focus on a handful of verses. But I want us to, to be reminded of the context and what is taking place here. So John chapter 4 in verse 7. And this is the, the holy inspired word of the living God. John 4 verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from, from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying... I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. When neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I, 
who speak to you and whom. May God bless the preaching of his word today. Father in heaven, we do come and, and we desire to bring you glory. We desire to see your name magnified. You are the king above all kings. You are the Lord above all lords. You are the creator and everything else is, is creature, is creaturely. And so we come to you today to worship, to bow down, to humble ourselves. We come today to draw near to you, to be instructed by you and by your word. And so we pray that you might speak today. I pray that you would that it cause me to decrease, that you would increase. I pray that you would keep any folly out of my lips, any error. Fall, let it fall on deaf ears, Lord. We ask your blessing on this time. Pray that you would work mightily by the power of your spirit, that we might be changed and transformed and encouraged to press on. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, something has been said here in this text that really is, is nothing less than a radical change. Jesus has made a very uh, paradigm-shifting change, if you will, with these words that he has said to this Samaritan woman at the well. And I, I just happen to find it very unique that this is whom he chose to give this, this, this radical shifting news to. But what he just said to this woman about the location of worship changes everything about the worship of God as far as the Jews have known it for a good 1,500 years up until this point. Jesus said that the location of worship is no longer relevant. That might seem sort of... It's not that big of a deal for us, but that means that everything is now new. Everything is now different. The temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices all took place in a specific location. And the location mattered. Jerusalem mattered. The Jews, as they were scattered, would travel three times a year. They would pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. They were instructed to do that. Jesus is telling her in this small statement that all of the shadows, all of the types of Old Testament worship are passing away because the substance has arrived in Christ. The shadow is no longer necessary. He does away with 1,500 years of religious practice. And he says that worship will now have a new character. It will not be focused primarily upon the outward forms upon the location, upon the procedures of the sacrifices, upon feasts and diets and clothing and all of the details. But because God is spirit, Jesus said, worship must be in spirit and in truth. We are, are considering in this little two-part sermon, um, as I've said, the regulative principle of worship. I've given you a handout in your bulletin. Does anybody find those helpful? No? Okay, I'll forget that. <laughs> so I, I gave you this short definition just to help understand what I'm saying. This is Ligon Duncan. He says, The Bible alone directs the form and content of Christian worship. It's basically all we're trying to say here, and that's what I believe Scripture teaches. The Bible alone directs the form and content of Christian worship. So last week we saw this principle demonstrated in various texts that God was very explicit as to how man was to approach him. And when people came to him not doing what was forbidden, but not doing what he had commanded, he brought judgment upon them. Today we're going to see this principle defended, Lord willing, from this text. And I have three headings here. You can see them on that, on that handout. We'll see firstly our Lord demanding right worship, our Lord demanding right worship, secondly, our Lord defining right worship, and then thirdly, our delighting in right worship. So look back into the passage with me and look at verse 23, what Jesus says. He says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, we've often, we've often heard, or maybe we've even embraced this idea that we don't have Leviticus part two in the New Testament, and thus we are spirit-filled, and we're sort of free to, to worship as we please, right? That is, that is an expression of the heart, and we, as long as we're sincere, we, we, we do what we, what we want. Now, let me be clear that what I'm discussing here is not worship in all of life. Certainly, we eat and drink to the glory of God, all that we do. So you can go out into the woods as you're stalking a deer with your rifle and commune with God and enjoy His creation. You can mop your kitchen floor to the glory of God and worship Him there and, and do it to His joy. Right? We're not talking about worship in all of life. We're talking specifically about the assembled church doing that which God has commanded us on His day, on the Lord's day. Far from taking a lax approach then here, Jesus makes a demand. He definitively explains what type of worship is pleasing to God. He says we must worship Him in this way. Now a question we might want to throw out there that might come to your mind is isn't this all a bit restrictive? Isn't this even maybe a bit legalistic? as we're talking about a specific way that God is pleased with worship. Can I not come to God in a sincere fashion with a heartfelt devotion and it not be proper worship? Well, I think Jesus says that is not the case, that worship must be offered in a certain way. And listen to what he says, why. He gives the why here. It's because God is spirit. God is the starting point when it comes to worship. I, I really feel like that shouldn't need to be said, but I think that it maybe it does. God is the starting point. And Jesus says God is spirit. Thus, it is the nature of God that dictates how he is to be worshipped. Notice he didn't address what might be meaningful to the Samaritans. You know, you've had this long-held tradition, and, and you really or feel close to God on this mountain, and as long as you're having a good experience, as long as you are sincere, then it's okay to worship on that. He didn't say that. He was not concerned with what might have been meaningful to the Jews. But he says, because of the nature of who God is, he must be worshipped in this way. Now that sort of flies in the face of our world today, doesn't it? We live in this sort of have-it-your-way type of world. You can drive down the street and there's a fast food a restaurant in every corner and you can drive through and you can have it your way just as you want it immediately. We live in a day of fast food, but also fast deliveries. I get on my phone and I order what I want and in two days, it's at my door. We, we even live in a time where I could look at any restaurant in town and go on to Grubhub or DoorDash or what have you and have their food on my front porch in 45 minutes. And if I want to hit contactless delivery, is that what it's called? You know what that really means? Don't talk to me. Put my food on the ground and I don't have to even see another human being. And it comes right to my door delivered how I want it at the snap of my fingers. Not only that, but we live in this environment where the customer is always right. If he's yelling, if he's demanding, he's the customer, so he must be right. So we've learned to think in such a way that if you want my business, you need to cater to me. You need to serve me. You need to give me what I want and how I want it, or I'm going to go and stop giving you my business and review you and speak ill of you. And now Jesus comes along and demands worship in a certain way. He does not leave the worship of God up to the desires of men, what pleases us, what our felt needs might be, but he says that God's very nature demands how he is to be worshipped. So we firstly have him demanding right worship. It must, it must be done in spirit and truth. And secondly, we have our Lord defining right worship. Our Lord defining right worship. Look with me again in verse 23. He says, the hour is coming 
and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus defines for us now right worship. And he gives two categories, two headings. Firstly, he says, biblical worship is to be in spirit, is to be in spirit. You, you might have a translation that capitalized spirit there. The consensus seems to be that he is not speaking specifically of the Holy Spirit, but something else. But think with me about the context. What is Jesus referring to? What is he what is he? Um, correcting her in her thinking. This Samaritan woman, she's fixed on the form of worship, right? She's focused on the external. Tell me where to worship rightly, and I'll do that, and then worship will be acceptable. You Jews say to worship here. Our fathers say to worship here. She has perceived that he is a prophet, and she wants to end the debate once and for all. Just let me know where I am to worship, and then I will be able to give God worship that is pleasing. She's focused on the outside, right? She's focused on the stuff that we do, the, the, the religious activities. While important, that's all she's really focused on, right? The mere outward form. And Jesus says, no, worship must be in spirit and truth. But can we not also fall into a similar error of this Samaritan woman where we just begin to focus on the externals of our faith. We can at times sort of walk through the motions and we might even say something like, hey, I've gone to church. I've done my duty. I've given my tithe. I've served in this ministry or that ministry. I've read my Bible today. I've said my prayers. God must be pleased with my worship because I've done those external forms. I've done the things that I'm supposed to do. And I think this error has creeped even into our understanding of salvation. I prayed the prayer. I went forward at the church. I even weeped. I shook the preacher's hand, i.e., I'm a Christian. Now, you may very well have gotten saved as you walked that aisle and prayed that prayer. But reciting words does not a Christian make. Doing external activities or saying certain words does not mean that the heart is moved and truly communing with God in any way. And I think that's what Jesus is driving at here. We heard Jesus last week quote Isaiah. Let me here read you the words of Isaiah. He says, because this people, this is our Lord, because this people draw near with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. They were good at going through the motions. Right? They were good at doing the things that God had told them to do, but their heart was not engaged. David's sort of infamous prayer in Psalm 51, after he sinned against God, against Bathsheba, against Uriah the Hittite, he says this, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Now, doesn't God command sacrifices in the Old Testament? Doesn't God command burnt offerings in the Old Testament? He certainly does. But he says, I don't want your outward form of religion. In Isaiah chapter 1, he goes even further, and he says, I hate your feast days. I hate your burnt offerings. I hate your sacrifices. These were things that God had commanded. They had to worship him in that way, but their heart had lost interest. Their heart was completely disengaged, and they were going through religious activity as if just going through the motions was pleasing to God. I ask you today, beloved, has your heart grown cold? Have you lost your first love? There may have been a time in your life where you were, were, were zealous for Christ and you loved the Lord Jesus. And maybe that 
love has waned. Maybe you've allowed the troubles of life to suffocate the joy that you once had in Jesus. Maybe sin has blinded you from the goodness of God that is offered in the gospel. Well, Jesus says here that first, worship must be in spirit. That is the opposite of worship that is merely external, merely about outward forms. True worship is internal. It is worship from the heart. God is spirit, he says. And so as God is spirit, we worship what we don't see. We live by faith and not by sight. And the Bible says that faith is the conviction of things not seen. The Bible says that faith comes through hearing the word of God, not seeing Christ. So worship in spirit focuses on internal matters. It is spiritual worship. I mean, think about what we're doing today, right now. We are entering into communion with an invisible God that we cannot see. So there is a spiritual element of biblical worship, a heartfelt internal worship. Terry Johnson says that this worship in spirit focuses on the intent, on the motive, on the intensity, the sincerity, the reverence of our worship. It is worship that has a true desire to seek God from the heart. I think the psalmist sums it up. He says, who, am I, who have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Beloved, I submit to you today that if your heart has grown cold, you've accepted a counterfeit. You've accepted a counterfeit. This world, our flesh, our enemy is constantly lying to us that greater joy is found outside of God. That biblical worship is, is, is boring. That reading the Bible is boring. That prayer is, is ineffective. That there are greater things to do, greater happiness to be had outside of the things of God. But the world sells a counterfeit. It cannot bring the contentment that only Christ can bring. So worship in spirit is worship that is internal. It is worship from the heart, but it is also worship that is simple. It is worship that is simple. Worship in spirit is worship that is unadorned. Remember, Jesus is saying that the Old Testament pomp and ritual and ceremony is passing away. No longer is all of that necessary or relevant, but Biblical worship now is worship that is simple. There's no temple required, no holy of holies required, no ark of the covenant required, no sacrifices because Jesus has accomplished a once for all sacrifice. No bronze altar, no showbread. None of these things are necessary anymore because as the book of Hebrews says, they served as a shadow and a copy of the heavenly things. But Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent because the covenant that he mediates is built on better promises. I find it interesting as we think about worship in our day. Think about the two furthest ends of the spectrum in Christian worship. On one side, you have the high church liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church, and you have the priesthood and the vestments, the the hats and all the uniforms, if you will. You have the cathedrals and you have all of the ceremony, all of the pomp. And it seems to me that that worship has gone back to what Christ here is saying is passing away. It's gone back to the visible, to the ceremony of it all. But the other side of the spectrum, you have the low church, contemporary sort of mega church, American church model. And on that side as well, We've in some ways gone back to the Old Testament ceremony of it all because that worship can't be done well without uh, an, an amazing audio-video experience and an eight-piece band of, of professional musicians. In some ways, both of these, although they are diametrically opposed to each other, are going back and getting away from this simple worship that Christ is, is putting forward here. 
As, as one man says, true worship that is simple can be done in an igloo in Alaska or a hunt, a hut in Africa or a cathedral in Paris. It doesn't need all of the adornments, but it is simply worship. We just need water, the word, bread, and wine, and we can, we can worship God in a biblical fashion. So worship in spirit is worship from the heart, worship that is simple. Now, if we stopped here, we might say, or if Jesus had stopped here, we might be able to say that sincerity is all that really matters. Right? He wants us to worship from the heart as long as we do what we think is best and we really love God while we're doing it, then that sort of worship is pleasing to him. But he didn't stop there. He said that worship is also according to truth. Worship in spirit and truth. Look with me in verse 21. He said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Notice what Jesus just told this woman. He says, you worship what you do not know. You worship in ignorance. You don't actually worship the God that you think you worship because you worship him wrongly. Now, what is the deal with the Samaritans? You may know that the Samaritans um, became a people after the Assyrians came in to the northern kingdom, attacked Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, after Israel was split after King Solomon, north and south. Samaria was the capital of the north, and the Assyrians came in, attacked Israel, took away many of their people, and also sowed the land with with pagans, other people. And the idea was really to erase this people from the earth, not just to take them out of their land, but destroy their culture, destroy their heritage. And the Samaritans, the, the northern people that were left over time, had intermarried, intermingled with these pagans, and of course, as it goes, had not only had children with them, but had imbibed some of their religious practices. And one of the things that they did is they had embraced the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but they rejected the rest of it. They only believed in the books of Moses. And apparently they didn't believe in them all that well because they were, didn't believe that worship needed to be taking place in, in Jerusalem. So the Samaritans had it wrong because they worshiped in the wrong place not according to God's truth. God had told them how he wanted to be worshipped, and Jesus said, you worship what you do not know. Of course, at this time, the place place did matter. That's why he's making the point that eventually it will not matter. So what is worship in truth? What what are we to understand from Jesus' words that worship is in spirit and truth? Worship in truth is, is worship according to the word. Worship that is informed by Scripture. When God speaks about truth, where are we expected to find this truth? His word, right? (laughs) From his word. When he says that worship is according to truth, he's given us truth. This is how, obviously, we know God. How we know his character. How we know what pleases him. How we know what sin and righteousness are. How we know what salvation is. So Jesus, I believe, is saying that we're not left to invent our own ideas as to what worship is, because the reality is we will always get it wrong. We will always get it wrong. Worship is always corrupted by sinful man. The Samaritans worshiped Yahweh. They had some of the Bible, and yet their worship was wrong because it was not according to what God had said. There's many examples we could consider about wrong worship and right worship. Very beginning of the Bible, God accepts Abel's offering, his sacrifice. He rejects Cain's. We, we, we could look at the worship of the golden calf. You remember what was said when that calf was raised up? Behold your God who delivered you out of Egypt. 
Now, they were worshiping the right God in the wrong way, right? It was a direct violation of the second commandment. We saw last week Nadab and Abihu, they approached God with unauthorized fire and God brought judgment upon them there. Now, why don't we look at one example? I want to look at today. It's 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. I think this is a helpful, another example of worship that is not acceptable to God because it is not according to God's instruction. It is not according to God's instruction. 1 Samuel 15. King Saul was instructed to attack the Amalekites and to destroy everything. All of them, everything was was to be consumed. Nothing was to be preserved. And we have his encounter here with Samuel. 1 Samuel 15, verse 18. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Now, this doesn't seem all that bad, does it? God had given Saul instructions to devote everything to destruction, but Saul had, at least in his mind, maybe a bit of a better idea than God had. He was going to take some of the best of the things that were to be devoted to destruction and offer them to God. I mean, isn't isn't that great? You've helped us win this battle. We're going to bring all of this treasure before you, and we're going to offer it to you because we're devoted to you, because we love you. And what is the prophet's response? Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Saul was presumptuous thinking that he knew better, that he would offer worship to God and that God would be pleased with this sacrifice. And the prophet says that presumption is as idolatry and iniquity because he came to God in a way that he had not instructed him to come. We see many examples of this in the Bible, all to sum up and say worship in truth is worship according to Scripture. Again, that quote from Ligon Duncan, the Bible alone directs the form and content of Christian worship. So it's worship that is according to the word, but worship in truth is also worship that is filled with the word. It is worship that is filled with scripture. When we look at the New Testament, we see worship filled with the word of God. Paul writes young Timothy and he instructs him, to read, to preach, and to exhort from the Scripture. We read that faith comes through hearing the Word, that growth in Christian maturity comes through the Word, that sanctification comes through the Word. As we look at the prayers of the New Testament, we see them filled with biblical themes and ideas. Paul prays for faith and hope and love and grace and peace. We're instructed in Colossians and Ephesians to sing. And and what is it that we are to sing? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that the word of Christ would dwell richly in our hearts. If Christ's word is going to dwell through our singing, we must be singing songs that are either straight from the Bible or informed and rich with scriptural content. 
And as we worship here at FBC, we are, we are called to worship by Scripture. We're called to confession by Scripture. We're assured of our gospel hope by Scripture. We are instructed and edified in a sermon by Scripture. We see the concepts from Scripture in the Lord's Supper and Baptism. We, we use God's Word to explain the meaning of them. We recite His words back to Him as we confess our faith, and He sends us out with His benediction from His Word. Worship in truth is worship that is filled with Scripture because Scripture is God's means of communicating with His church. So Jesus demands right worship, that it must, He says, be done in spirit and truth. He defines right worship. Because God is spirit, He should be worshiped in spirit and truth. And lastly, our delighting in right worship. Our delighting in right worship. Notice here in the text, whom the Father seeks. Who is God really seeking? He's not seeking here servants. He's not seeking pastors. He's not seeking preachers. He's not seeking evangelists, theologians, apostles. He's not seeking godly parents. He's not seeking faithful church members. Those will all be the fruit of whom he seeks. But notice what it says in verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here when the true Worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So who is, who is God seeking? God is seeking true worshipers. That is the goal when you come to Christ, that you be a true worshiper, that you be set free from idolatry, from false worship of anything and everything, and saved to the right worship of God. Our Lord is drawing a people to Himself from every tongue, every tribe, through the pronouncing of good news. A salvation has come in His Son. And as you, beloved, at one point, and as sinners are set free from guilt and shame and the reign of sin, we are set free from delighting in inferior things. I say that again. We are set free from delighting in inferior things. Things. To be saved, says Terry Johnson, is to be delivered from the ignorance and oppression of idolatry. To be delivered from the ignorance and oppression of idolatry. The flesh is constantly erecting idols in our hearts. As Calvin said, the heart is an idol factory. Whether it be money or power, a job, prestige, our looks, our influence leisure activities, control over everything and everyone. We are constantly erecting idols. And as God has called you, beloved, as God has called you to right worship, He has fulfilled the greatest longing of your soul. He has fulfilled the greatest longing of your soul. You and I have been made in the image of God, and it's been said that because of that, we are inescapably religious, inescapably religious. Religious. Man is a religious creature. Go to the Ducks game on a Saturday afternoon and you will see a faithful people, right? With all of their colors and their chants and their commitment to this cause. Now, I enjoy a football game, but we are a religious people. It is in our very nature. So right worship in spirit and truth then is the most fulfilling thing that you can do. If we were created to worship, the greatest thing that we can do is to worship God rightly. Because right worship sets the greatest object before our hearts and before our eyes. That is, of course, the triune God of Scripture. So to worship as God commands fulfills the greatest desire of a human soul. And as you know, you will search high and low to find contentment in this life. You will try to buy it. You might try to eat it. You might try to drink it or smoke it or wear it or marry it. But you were created to worship your creator. And when you worship the one you know in the way that he has commanded, that is when true joy and contentment is found. We saw last week the words of the prophet Isaiah 
in 58, 13, he says this, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall delight in the Lord. Notice there, I believe, even back in Isaiah 58, worship that is in spirit and truth. God is saying, delight in me and do it on my day, in my prescribed way, and then you will take delight in the Lord. So lastly, church, are you a true worshiper? Are you a true worshiper? Has God delivered you from the oppression of idolatry? Has God delivered you from the burden of trying to find that which He can only give in other things? This deliverance, of course, begins with repentance and faith. Repentance from idolatry, from all of our idols, and faith in the one true God that is worthy of worship. Christ alone is worthy of worship. I asked earlier if you are here today and and your heart is a bit cold. Maybe you're distant from the Lord. Maybe that's grown over a season, or maybe it's just the time of your life right now. Maybe you find biblical worship and the means of grace to be, to be tedious and, and a bit boring. You, you've wandered off into other things. Maybe you're just distant for whatever reason. Again, I submit to you that you have fallen for an impossible. You have believed a lie, and that lie is that God cannot meet all of our needs. That God cannot truly satisfy the longing of our hearts. That we need a bit more, a bit more excitement, a bit more fun. I challenge you today, if you've come here distant from the Lord, to take Him at His word. Allow Him to be the Lord of worship. Seek Him in His prescribed manner. And as He says then you shall take delight in the Lord. Our Lord here today reminds us that He defines what worship is in spirit and truth, and He seeks those that will worship Him in that way. And He promises you that when you do, you will be satisfied in Him because He is not only seeking, He is creating true 